<clears throat> so it's my pleasure, everybody, to introduce our next virtual speaker. Uh, so I'd like to welcome to the virtual stage Anya Scheel. So Anya studied biology at the University of Mans, uh, took his PhD uh, in molecular biology at the University of Amsterdam, and did postdoctorate studies at the University of Oslo. So a true pan-European scholar. Uh, now, Anya is the lead methodologist in regulatory and pharmacoeconomic statistics at the Nordic um, Medicines Agency, is alternate member of the Scientific Advice Working Party for the EMA, and is vice chair of UNETA 21. So, um, yeah, take it away, Anya. Uh, thank you. And uh, as much as I would like to work at the Nordic Medicines Agency, the Norwegian one, <laughs> my <laughs> colleagues from the other countries might not be happy if they i told that I'm the boss. And uh, if you can get my first slide. Um, I was uh, asked to talk about the uh, ability to learn from the, the one-stop shop the regulators have, uh, so the EMA process. And I would like to remind everybody that the EMA was not created overnight. It took them also a, a good decade before they actually reached the level where everything was going smoothly. Uh, and it's not that surprising that the HDAs might not be just as quick. And I will explain why. Um, next slide, please. I would uh, like to refer again to the um, possibly longest running, longest financed initiative uh, in the joint action program, which was the UNETA initiative. And on the next slide, I would like to highlight that you have to consider this as going from theoretical physics to the applied physics of launching a rocket. And the last arrow is also a slightly different color because now this is no longer um, a uh, scientifically based exercise. As you already heard uh, uh, in the first presentation, this is now a paid activity. And as a paid activity, obviously, you have to fulfill your contractual obligations. Um, but that does not automatically mean that uh, all the problems that we have spent more than a decade discussing have suddenly miraculously disappeared. Uh, it's quite the opposite. We have to find some solutions um, on producing all these documents that we are required to produce um, and finding the, the middle ground, um, and that is difficult enough, I would say, as it is because, next slide, if you look where we started out, on the left-hand side, there were high expectations. Uh, it should be, uh, the, the health technology assessment as such was as many, many domains that you have to look at, and all of these were included in the original HDA core model. The first thing that went was anything that used the word cost and economic, which is maybe something that most people find uh, counterintuitive because this is what we work for. This is applied HDA. We're not doing this anymore for a scientific interest. We are doing this because it has to lead to something, a decision. And this decision in the end is the famous health economy that is kind of vaguely used for, for anything that includes money or the word cost. And then you see that the domains that um, in the end were uh, originally thought to be some kind of checklist were also gone. So we have already slimmed down whatever we have to achieve within UNETA, and we have reduced it uh, to um, the core um, elements that now would comprise a JCA, a joint uh, uh, consultation assessment. Next slide. What doesn't go away is a simple fact that we all have different methodologies, and our methodologies are meant to inform a decision. When you look at these uh, slide and you look at the different columns, then you will see that the unit of effect starts with pretty much nothing, which is kind of, well, you just look at data and you find them convincing or not, um, over natural units, over the heavily debated qualities, which are actually exactly what you just heard from ESMO. This is what a quality is. It's a description of a universal comparable unit of health that you can acquire as a, as a country, um, which you can compare across different indications for fairness reasons. And on the top you see the one thing that nobody wants to talk about, that's the euro symbol. And the same on the right hand side, you see that there are limitations to all of them, and we are very much aware of them. 
The problem is, um, different countries have uh, different places on this chart, and they do not move. We will all stick to our methodology. Next slide. There's also this one. It's a nice uh, adaptation of uh, your party on this uh, publication from Berger in 2005. There is um, a blurring line between the assessment and the appraisal. The appraisal is a decision. The, the green thing at the end for most of us. For others, the entire process of the decision making is the appraisal already. And again, for others, um, even going from the evidence review and synthesis is, is already moving towards appraisal and that falls outside the remit. So if you take, um, you know, little flags of all of Europe, you can place them anywhere on this figure. Um, everybody has a different idea where they are in this assessment versus appraisal landscape. Next slide. And then you can choose your perspective. You can either have a societal perspective um, you can see the benefits of, of those. You can also see what um, aspects are going into a societal perspective. Um, it does include already cost. You know, at some point you cannot get away from cost because that's what HDA, as I say, is meant to be. You can also have a health sector perspective that is a very different one. You optimize something else. Uh, or you can have the patient perspective. Uh, and the patient perspective and the health sector perspective and the societal perspective do not always go hand in hand. Sometimes they do, um, sometimes they don't. And that's a simple fact. Uh, and another really important aspect is the next one. Next slide. This, this is how economics work in a nutshell. Um, if Apple buys a phone um, or sells a phone, you as a seller can decide whether you want to buy it or not. Health, insurance, and health markets work different. There's this insurer, or you can place an HDA or a country into the green bubble. That one pays, the provider provides, the patient has benefit or not, but the patient doesn't have to pay. There's a reason for that. Uh, you don't want to put patients into the situation as they experience in the US. You don't have the money. You know there's a drug that could work for you, but you don't have the money because you don't have an insurer and even if it costs just a couple of bucks, if you don't have these bucks, you don't get access. We have social health care in Europe, which means that we have split it up. And it also means that patients are in a way protected. And sometimes they don't really understand it, but they are protected by the uh, HDA processes and the insurers to not be faced with um, unovercomable prices. Because some of the drugs that are available are really very, very expensive. And most patients don't even know what their drugs cost. And it's good that they don't have to know that. So the last slide is one that uh, everybody can have a look. This is uh, uh, something that you get from WHO. You can see the difference in uh, percentage of um, uh, the, the total expenditure um, across the globe. I don't want to pinpoint a particular country in Europe uh, or, or blame them for something, but you can, for example, see that the Russians apparently have increased the, the spending on healthcare substantially in just one year. And this is not the effect of COVID because that, that isn't taken on board uh, uh, in this analysis. And you can also see on the bottom left the figure of the rising costs in the Nordic countries. And we should never forget that all these decisions are based on a political mandate. Um, in contrast to EMA, we are not just sitting there and having scientific discussions. We have a mandate from home. And an uh, important mandate is that healthcare systems must be sustainable. We need to be able to buy good health for the majority of our patients. And if we are forced to persistently uh, say no because the evidence is weak and we have better health to, to buy, then that looks from the outside as if we are really horrible people that just don't want to give patients access to good drugs, which is not true. That's a really good drug get re gets reimbursed, irrespective of in which country you pass by. If it's really amazing and you have a reasonable ethical price, you will get reimbursed everywhere on this globe. And the last slide, I know that there are huge expectations, but we are playing around with puzzle pieces. And I know that 
everybody has the idea they know exactly what the picture is going to be like, but I feel that we don't. We have no agreed picture that we are building when we play with our puzzle pieces. Quite the opposite. And as beautiful as this picture is, it reflects that we are in a situation where everybody is talking about something, this legislation, and everybody has an interpretation of this legislation, and everybody seems to know what everybody else is going to do once the legislation is uh, implemented, and I doubt. I doubt that we have the same picture in mind that is going to be the puzzle we are supposed to build. Thank you. So thanks, Anya, for this presentation. Um, again, I would suggest to cover, keep the questions for the podium discussion later, the panel discussion later on.